This is Rock Majerman is with Greg Martin. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. I'm here in Electric Lazy Land, which is my little studio. And, <laughs> and it's been a pretty good laid back day doing a few interviews. And uh, I got to go do a little overdub session for a friend this afternoon. But uh, it's pretty laid back, man. We're, we've got a few more days off. Then we start touring again next week. Then the season kind of starts back up. So you've been basically just living in the studio for a little bit, a little bit? Well, you know, we did the latest album. It's it's a fact, Jack. That was actually recorded last February and finished up around April. Uh, now, this year, we've done a couple of shows already, but uh, we've... Um, we, yeah, I've got, I, I do mostly radio. I do a radio show. I do... This is this is going to turn into a studio at some point where I can do, you know, like outside projects and overdubs for people. I can do radio production. But no, I haven't really been in the studio much this year. Just overdubs for folks every now and then, you know. Man, that's been just, not... Sorry? I've just been down, been down in the basement watching Westerns mostly. Uh, oh, yeah, that Western movies. You know, those Western movies are really good. I've only yeah. watched them. I've only watched like the Billy the Kid, but either way, they're pretty good. I never yeah. Really, yeah. On a young dog and stuff. But. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how's life been treating you with everything, you know, touring? And... Well, life's been fine. I mean, if you go back to 2019 to pre-pandemic, you know, we were, we thought we, well, we were, it was a, uh, you know, we, you know, it was normal, you know, we, we did our touring, we were able to go to Walmart without a mask, we were able to go to restaurants, you know, and then when we hit early 2020, we had done about five shows, and our last show before the pandemic hit was in Alexandria, Virginia, we played at the Birchmere, and we had about three or four weeks off before the touring kicked back in. This is 2020. And as you know, when we were home, about a week or two home, dates started disappearing. Dates started getting moved. Things started locking down. By May, it was crazy. And um, it was an interesting time because I have, I've been on the road, been on the road since 1979, 1980, been on a bus since 1981. And to be home, <laughs> you know, all that time, it was it was kind of weird. And um, so basically, I just spent the time working on my basement, cleaning my basement out, spending time with my family. And um, I unfortunately, I got COVID in November of 2020. And it wasn't a bad case, but I got through that OK. But 2020, we only did about nine shows. And uh, so we got through that. And then going into 2021, well, we were actually going to start working on a new album at the end of 2020. But when I got COVID, that kind of threw things into array. And we had to move things up to early 2021. And then we finally got in the studio in February last year and we completed the album. It took about, you know, like two, three months to get it all together. And, uh, but I can't complain, man. I can't complain, Jam, man. Life, life's been okay. Okay. You know? Well, that's wonderful, man. Thank God life's okay, you know. Life is good, buddy. It's always good getting up in the morning, having a cup of coffee. And if, if you're hearing Led Zeppelin in your head, you can always come down. I can come down here and I can pull Led Zeppelin 1 out. If I hear uh, Cream <laughs> or whatever, whatever music I want to hear, man. Or if I'm, hey. It's always a good day when I can just pick this thing up and play the blues. Right? Yeah, that's amazing. It's always a good day to play guitar or play drums. Yeah, man. That's just, wow. So you can just sit back and just go like this, huh? Yeah, man. Just... You know, man. <laughs> that's cool man how's that well this is this is my music room man you see i got my old marshalls here my my germino i 
Then you look over here, I got a few guitars there. <laughs> and I got walls of CDs. It's all about music, brother. It's all about you know? music. I get you, man. I know you do. Yeah. <laughs> Kindred spirit, man. Yeah. That's like, wow. That's just crazy how you can just sit back and just like do that. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, it's fun, man. It's, it's a gift. It's a gift from above, my brother. You know, yeah. it is. It really is sometimes, you know. So you're having fun? You're having fun doing what you're doing, aren't you? Yeah, I'm pretty having much a lot of fun. You know, it's fun to talk all to these new rocks, all to these new rock stars, and then old rock stars, you know, like classic rock, rock stars and stuff like that. Some of us old Geritol rockers, man, we were still around. We got we got to set you up with the Georgia Thunderbolts. You know who those guys are? No, no, I do not. Check the Georgia Thunderbolts out, man. We're going to get you, we got to set you up set you up with riley the guitar player you check them out i know they're on mascot mascot okay. records yeah right. yeah they're good friends of ours okay that's cool all right i'll do yeah. it yeah 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 so what are you into my brother what are you into well what do you mean music um i like all kinds of music but i really do like uh rock i like some country songs i i kind of yeah. i kind of do a little mix sometimes i like stuff like that it's pretty cool what's your favorite artist um, I really do like Black Sabbath sometimes. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. It, it, is it hard to believe you're a young man? When I was in high school, back in, say, let's go back to 1970. I know it's hard for you to take this, but me and my brothers and the Headhunters were listening to Black Sabbath. I mean, I remember the first time that I bought the, I bought the Paranoid album. And when we were kids, we were playing, you know, we were playing. I don't know what key it's in now, but we used to play uh, Iron Man when we were in high school. And isn't it, isn't it neat how music can transcend generations? You love Black Sabbath. I love Black Sabbath when I was a kid. You know, that's the beauty of music. Yeah, it's the beauty of your music, man. It's just the only sad part is that my generation really doesn't like that kind of stuff anymore. They don't really think that's actually cool. That they don't think that's the like cool. That's stuff. strange. That's strange. But but you, I bet you love Deep Purple. Yeah. Oh my God, I love that one. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now we do it country. Hey, like that? <laughs> oh my God, man, that's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> no, man, that's the beauty. Of, uh, it's a beautiful thing about music, man. You could take any. You could take. You could take smoke on the water. You could do it country. You could do it blues. You could do it any style. But I, I'm I'm happy that you appreciate the roots of what rock is. Um, do you like Led Zeppelin? Oh uh, yeah, actually, I got an interview with them tomorrow. Do you? Sister. Who are you talking to? Uh, his sister. Oh yeah, 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 great. Yeah. Uh, John, yeah, yeah, John Bonham's sister, I think, maybe. Yes. That's cool. Uh, I saw Led Zeppelin in 1977. It was it was a wonderful experience. You know, it it really was. Um, saw Queen the same year. Saw Queen, and you know who opened up for Queen when I saw him? Then Lizzy. Oh, oh, really? I actually interviewed them. Though. Yeah, yeah. I actually interviewed uh, them. I've heard you've interviewed a lot of people. I think it's so cool that you're keeping that you, your generation, is keeping the roots of rock alive, man. Hats off to you. Bravo. Thank you. Just you're doing a good job. Because this, uh, this music is wonderful, you know. And countries too. Yeah, what kind of country do you like? Any anything in particular? Oh. I love. Um, I think I like country. Mama, take me home. Oh, oh, country road. Yeah, country road. Country road. That's John Denver. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You like Merle? You like Merle Haggard? Or... I like Johnny Cash. Oh, of course. <laughs> I 
I don't have a pick. I wish I did. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing this without a pick. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Johnny Cash, man, he's a uh, he's the cool he's the cool dude. I we met him many many years ago. Him and June. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's awesome, man. We you meet everybody. You listen to everybody. well. We we we've got, you know music has been good to Fred, Richard, Doug, and I. We've um, it's opened the doors. You know. We, we come from rural areas and that's the beauty about music. It doesn't matter where you're from. You know, if you're true to your calling, you know, you, and you follow that path, you'll get to meet, it's, I never thought I'd get to, you know, I've been around, I never really got to talk to him. I've been around Eric Clapton uh, at the Grammy Awards. I got to meet Johnny Winter uh, and a lot of people that, you know, when we we're growing up in Midcap County, look, which is about 20 miles from here, I never thought in our life that we would ever get to do what we've got to do. It's just been a blessing. Yeah. So congratulations on that Kentucky Headhunters new album. That's a fact, Thank you. Heck. That's a Yes. Fact. Thank you. Yeah. That was a wonderful album, man. Nice. Thank you. That was uh, recorded last year as we were crawling out of the wreckage of the pandemic oh, yeah. and it's a product of the pandemic in a way. Um, it was finally, you know, once we got through the recording process, the mixing and the uh, mastering and, and the paperwork with the label, the distribution, all that, it was released back in October. And we're just now really, so we're still working it. And uh, the first single was, how could I, which was actually written by uh, Richard, our rhythm guitarist in Blackstone Cherry, and who are another local band. And uh, the new single is, uh, I believe they're getting ready to start working. It's a fact jack, which uh, is basically the message is, let's get it together or the train's going off the track, you know. But it's a, a very diverse album. It represents the band where it's at these days. And everybody sings, everybody uh, has their moment, but it, it's a very group oriented album. Yeah, I get that. You know, I, I get that part where like, you know, the trains will fall, you know, go off the tracks if we don't, you know, unite and stuff and be friends. Exactly. The one glue that holds everything together is love and everybody needs to love each other. And we're not always going to agree on things. We're not always going to get along, but, you know, come on. There's no sense in fighting. There's no sense in letting, and I won't get into all this, but there's no sense in letting politics or whatever get in the way of our friendship and our love for each other. You know, that life is too short, man. Yeah, life really is too short. Yes, sir. Now, before I get into it, can you please let Fred know that he has the coolest side, sideburns in the industry? I will. I will. Fred Young is the, the drummer, and he does. He has great sideburns. <laughs> he a uh, great drummer. That's Richard's brother. And uh, Fred is probably just now getting up because he he's he keeps weird hours. You know, Fred, when he's home, he 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 likes to farm. He likes to play with these tractors. Oh. He uh, has old trucks, and he, you know he. And, and last night I was talking to him real late at night, and he did go up to the practice house to play it, play his drums a little bit. But I will let Fred know. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Those are just some nice sideburns, bro. They're longer than my actual own hair. And I've been growing it for like a while now, dude. How cool is it? Yeah, oh my God, man. That's a, that's and that's pretty impressive how you're able to keep up with that, like everything. That's pretty impressive. He's uh Fred's doing good, man. I mean, we're we're getting ready to start touring next week. So I'll see those old sideburns on the bus pretty soon, you know. I call I call him affectionately call him uh, Eagle Boy. Because if he takes his hat off, there's no hair on top, and I just call him Eagle. <laughs> <laughs> that first uh, single, "How Could I," was like a ama um, awesome. I've like that Thank blussy you. southern rock song, just amazing, yeah. man. 
Thank you. That uh, there again, that was written by Blackstone Cherry and Richard. When it we listened to the demo, it was a whole different vibe. We kind of pulled it back. I, I like to say it's a cross between there was a group called Jojo Gun. It's a cross between Jojo Gun, uh, the Stones, and the Georgia Satellites. It's of course, it sounds like the Kentucky Ad Hunters. That's the end result is always going to be that. But that's that's a really nice song. It's a good groove and it just feels good, you know. Was that the last guitar solo that you did in that sound? How did you get the guitar to sound like that? It had like a different sound to it. It's slide. That's slide guitar. Um, I I would show you, but I don't have a, a guitar tune. I think that was tuned to open A, tuned to open A, and it's it, it's this big old it's this guitar called a Ventura. I wish I had it to show you. Uh, if you, Ventura Dan Armstrong copy, which is a heavy plexiglass guitar, I tuned it to open A, and um, I think I put the first guitar. The first guitar, uh, the rhythm guitar down, Richard's playing one rhythm, I'm playing one. I went back and overdubbed that solo in open A with a slide. There's slide guitar, and that's what slide is. Okay. You know, of course, I mean, I can't do the solo here, but slide sounds kind of like this. You know, you got the. You know, you got that kind of that whiny sound, so to speak. Okay. I've always loved how the guitar uh, guitar can do different things and make different sounds like that. And if you just get the right objects, it can always make those crazy sounds. Yeah, man, it's it's a, it's a you know, a lot of the tone is right here, right here, and you know, you can I mean you can emulate I mean I can emulate a steel guitar. Now this is not my normal guitar. You could do the uh, like a steel you know a steel guitar. And this is what they call chicken picking. Just use your finger. You know, or you play blues, man. There you go. <coughs> it's all in the, it's all here, man. Heart and hands. Wow, didn't know the hands could do that much. <laughs> oh man, you could do it. You could do it too. If I can do it, you can. Oh, God, <laughs> I'm getting my own private show here. <laughs> <laughs> Mike and Glad Drake. to do it. Yeah, man. I'm just like, this is like, um, what are they called again? I, I had it one time. It was one of these interviews where I literally had an actual show playing for me. What are they called? Private acoustic. A private acoustic. Oh, okay. It was kind of like a, well, you know, man, it's kind of like a, like a little guitar seminar where you demonstrate, uh, like us in Kentucky, you know, what, what we grew up in Kentucky, this is what you call Travis picking, which was, uh, it originated here in the state. You hear it okay? There's a little Travis picking, man. Yeah. If you want to play, if you want to play some deep blues, man, you want some blues. That's the good thing about music, man. However you feel, you can express it. You know. Wow, man. <laughs> I can't, man. This is the first time I ever heard like stuff like that on a guitar. Wow. Man, <laughs> this is just hey, cool. man. Just go back and listen to Jimi Hendrix, and then you can go on, go forward and listen to Stevie Ray Vaughan, Jimmy Vaughan. Listen to B.B. King, Freddie King, Albert King, Otis Rush, Muddy Waters. It's all there, brother. We all learn from those folks right there. I Can Dream by Fleetwood Mac when Lindsay did his own solo. I never heard anything like it before. Just crazy. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, man. I'll tell you what you do. You like Fleetwood Mac, right? Yeah, I like him. And you, and you like Lindsay Buckingham. Mm -hmm. Have you ever talked to him? 
No, not yet. Mary, <laughs> well, you maybe will someday. Maybe. Um, go back and listen to early Fleetwood Mac. Okay. With Peter Green on guitar. Okay. And Lindsay would agree with me on this. Uh, Peter Green was one of the most amazing white blues guitarists ever. And um, I've had this conversation with Billy Gibbons before about Peter Green. You check Peter Green out. It, it's a tragic story in a way because the guy had a meltdown oh. due to a drug overdose. Did uh, he kill him? No, but he was never the same. He, he went downhill after that. He just passed away a year or two ago, but he never was quite right after that. But he is the early the early Fleetwood Mac was amazing. It was a, a, a blues band. Of course, in the 70s, they morphed into the super group they become with, you know, Stevie Nicks and Lindsay, you know, and, and they're great, of course. But uh, check out Peter Green. So if you folks are listening out there, if you've never heard Peter Green, check him out. So please. was he like, was like, what would he do after that? If you would like came in contact with him, would he like try to kill you or something? Oh, no, no, he was he wasn't. Uh, mean or anything uh man he, you know if you go back and listen to the fleetwood mac there's a song called stop messing around check that song out okay his style was perfect it just seemed like after the he had the bad trip on acid slowly his uh mental health dissipated and um he just got I don't know. It, it wasn't the same after that. So would he like do something like oh, like that? It, no, it wasn't. It wasn't that man. He just he just got he got one thing. He gave his guitars away. Okay. He sold his Les Paul, his '58 Les Paul. He sold it to uh, Gary Moore. Gary Moore, great guitars, by the way. But nothing wrong with that. But he, but then he started giving his royalties away. He started. His, just acted irrational, so to speak, okay. you know, okay. just irrational. He wasn't mean. And, and I think that one rumor was that he become a grave digger <laughs> after all that. Oh. He got out of the music business. So, but he was a great blues guitarist, man. I mean, it, he could play great blues, just great stuff. Did you ever meet him? Never met him. I wished I could have met him. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I, should, you know, it would have been great meeting if he was having a good day, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But uh, to meet him, if he wasn't having a good day, and like I say, I don't think he was mean spirited or anything, but um, could he really communicate? I, I'm not really sure, uh -huh. you know. Now, yeah. did you guys write this album during the lockdown? Yeah, most, most of the songs, not all of it. Uh, most of the songs were product of crawling out of the wreckage of 2020. Um, uh, let me think a minute. Let me let me kind of. I don't have the album in front of me, but I got a list here. I can kind of give you an idea. Sorry about my mess here, but let's see. Going to be all right was a new song that was written during the pandemic. How could I was probably an older song from a few years ago that we just brought forward and rearranged it. Uh, Watercolors in the Rain was a new song. Uh, Susanna was a song that Doug Phelps wrote, you know, two or three years ago. Cup of Tea was a new song that Fred wrote. Uh, we Belong Together was a fairly new song. That's a Fact Jack was a new song that was probably written during the pandemic because it talks about what's going on. Lonely Too Long was a new song. Uh, Heart and Soul was a song that the Headhunters wrote at the practice house a few years ago and we had a cassette of it we listened to it and we just rearranged it and brought it forward to what we sounded like cheap tequila was written by rick derringer uh it was uh, rick derringer recorded it in 1973 johnny winter also recorded it and uh shotgun effie we wrote back in 1973 and we just redid it and Let's All Get Together and Fight was a song that Richard had written three or four years ago that we put together in the studio. So there, it's kind of a mixture. It's a Duke's mixture of things, you know, pretty much. Okay. Um, were you guys um, able to send, uh, well, able to record and write in person or did you guys do it all by yourself and like send it to each other? 
like you guys would send each other samples and stuff. Well, and, and that, that's correct. We, uh, in the early part of 2021, we were all sending each other snippets of ideas and song ideas, and we weren't able to get together. So basically, once we had those ideas compiled, we, we got together in the studio in February of last year, and we would just bring the songs out and work on them on the spot that hit record and go for it. So a lot of it was just people sending stuff through email, but the recording was all done in person starting in February last year, and we got it done. Um, what made you decide to re-record a Shotgun Avi? Was it because of Itchy Brother song? Yeah. Okay. Well, Itchy Brother was our rock band that we had from high school and really good rock band. But in 1973, we wrote Shotgun Affy and we went in a studio, a small studio in Burksville, Kentucky, and we recorded it. That and the flip side was a song called Rock and Roller, which is another fun song. And uh, we were released it in early 74 on a small, it was just maybe like 500 copies of a 45 record. And he was, you know, we were young. We weren't really mature as musicians and people seemed to really like Shotgun Affy. And we kept talking about uh, redoing it and we got in the studio and I thought originally we might change it up a bit, but as soon as we started recording, it kind of went back to 1973. And I, you know, we matured as musicians and I think we have a good definitive version of it now that, uh, you know, we just needed to record it while we could. It was just something we needed to do. What was it like for you to take over as lead? Lead singing? Yeah. Lead okay. singing. Well, it was hard because I don't really sing that much. I'm, I don't consider myself a singer. I haven't put the do. I haven't paid my dues as a singer. I, uh, I mean, I used to sing back in, you know, the 70s, and I, there was a brief time where I aspired, where maybe I would do that, but I don't know, over the years, I was playing in bands that always had a good singer, and I just kind of backed off from it. Uh, I don't know, it was hard, because I, I tried to sing the song in the same key I did back in 73, so it about killed my throat a little bit. Uh, is it going to make me want to be a lead singer? I no. doubt it. <laughs> I don't just, think so. Nope. Nah, man. I, I, I'm happy just playing guitar. You know? Can you show me how to sing? Could you show me if you can? Singing? Yeah. Oh, man. You don't want to hear me sing, man. Nah, come Actually. on, man. You want to hear me sing? Um, here, I'll do your country version of Big Boss Man. Okay. Big Boss Man. Do you hear me when I call? Big boss man. Don't you hear me when I call? Well, you're not so big. You're just tall, that's all. There you go. That's my, that's my end of singing today. How's that? That's amazing, <laughs> man. That's amazing. Nice. I'm serious. Yeah, lady. <laughs> wow. hey that the funny thing is jam man the voice on shotgun effie is not really the way i sing now because if i was to have to sing it would be in a lot lower reg register so you know yeah. if i was going to sing it'd be more country blues type stuff really you know i know the song young's was about uh grandmother uh effie but is your is that your grandmother too because your cousins uh, no, uh, Shotgun Effie, Miss Effie Young was about Richard and Fred's grandmother. Okay. And uh, she was just a dear old lady that we all loved. And she actually gifted the practice house to us. And she was always there to help us out in different ways. And I love that lady so much. Uh, that song was written as a tribute to her, you know, and she, she wasn't a mean lady, but she wouldn't take no crap off anybody. <laughs> you know, she was pretty spunky. She drove this old truck around and she did have a gun in that truck. 
I don't think it was a shotgun, but I just thought shotgun epi was a the way to ride it, you know. Um. So, um, did it really affect you when she passed away? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. She passed away in the eighties. Yeah, yeah. That was a. Even though that was Richard and Fred's grandmother, and uh, but she was a dear dear friend, and I loved her. I I, I got a kick out of her because I knew how to man i mean that lady was spunky and uh she, she wouldn't take no crap but i i knew i knew the way to her heart i love that lady she was just so cool you know yeah yeah now with the itchy brothers you were signed to a swan song records which was owned by led zeppelin but they never put out your album is that right well what happened jam man is we were very close to signing with uh swan song the album wasn't actually recorded we had recorded demos and our manager who worked for swan song mitchell fox he had a meeting he was going to have a meeting with peter grant and that's a long story but he never the meeting never quite happened he flew to england to have the meeting but then right after that john bonham passed away uh you know the drummer and um you know, after that, Swan Song was kind of put on the shelf. Led Zeppelin kind of took a hiatus, and our connection with them ceased, so to speak. And by 1981, we just kind of took a break from Itchy Brother and went to do different things. So it never, even though we were we were very close to getting signed, it just never happened because of John Bonham's death, pretty much. Oh. Yeah. You are you kind of angry about that, or not that really that much? Oh no, I'm not. I'm not angry at all. I, at the time, I think we were all disappointed, hurt a little bit, but like, there again, it's like uh, things happen in life. You know, one closed door is another open door. So we had unfinished business to do in other areas. You know, uh, you know, if Itchy Brother had happened in 1980, 81. It would have been. It was a great rock and roll band. Uh, I don't know if we would. We weren't really doing anything different than what was going on. The Headhunters actually, when we got that together, was something different that actually changed country music a little bit. Yeah. You know. So you know things happen for a reason. They happen for a reason, and you just go with it, man. Um, did you ever get to meet any of the guys in Led Zeppelin? In Led Zeppelin, my bad. Robert Plant. You did? Met Robert Plant. Uh, well, we were around. We were around Jimmy Page. Uh, Jimmy Page was at Guitar Center in California back in the nineties, and he was uh, putting his handprints in the sidewalk out there. And we were at the reception. He walked by and kind of nodded at us. Um, didn't really get to meet and talk to him then, but we did get to meet Robert Plant. We went to a plant, uh, a page plant show in Nashville. Oh, I don't know what year it was, 1998, 97, 98. And we went, our, our manager, Mitchell Fox, who worked for Swan Song, he got us backstage and uh, Robert came back and talked to us. Never met John Paul Jones, you know, of course, unfortunately, we would have got to meet Led Zeppelin. You know, if we'd signed with Swan Song, we would have got to meet them, but it just didn't went in the cards, you know. I get you. Well, you know, that's sad, but you know. Yeah. Hey, things. You just roll with it, brother, you know. Did you know when Swan uh, Song's offices were cleared out in 1983, they found early demos from Iron Maiden and heart and heart that were never played <laughs> i believe it i believe it they had our, they had our demos too but of course our demos were being listened to <laughs> and we were being we were talking about signing and all that stuff but yeah you're right yeah they had they had demos oh yeah our manager mitchell fox he he was there man so yeah that's true and you uh guys um so you guys broke up in 1982, then reunited in 1986 as the Headhunters. Well, the band 
it's actually 81. And, and I like to say we never really broke up. We just took a hiatus. We took a, we took break. a break, took a break and to rethink things because we really, we tried to get a record contract. Disco was rearing its head. There was just different things going on that didn't work. Um, it just wasn't in the cards for us to sign. So in 1981, we took a break. I took a job with a country artist by the name of Ronnie McDowell out of Nashville. Fred took a job with an artist by the name of Sylvia. Richard went to work writing songs at Acuff Rose. Um, I met Doug Phelps through Ronnie McDowell. So there was some maturing we had to do individually and as musicians and get some experience. And so, yes, we put me and Richard and Fred started talking in 1986 about putting the band back together. But when our cousin Anthony didn't want to do it, we went another direction and we asked Doug Phelps to come up and uh, jam with us. And instead of going with the itchy brother name, we ended up uh, calling it the Headhunters, you know, and just went a whole different direction. Yeah. Now, and you guys borrowed $4,500 to record a demo with seven original songs and four covers? Well, what happened? Okay. The, the, the fellow by the name of Jonathan D.W. Lyle out of Richmond, Virginia. I was, me and Doug were playing with Ronnie McDowell one night at a place called Dukes in Richmond, Virginia. And we played, at the end of the night, we played Hideaway by Freddie King. <laughs> That song right there. And this fella, this fella walked up and said, uh, oh, you guys like blues? And we said, yeah. Me and Doug were talking to him and said, yeah, man, we got a little blues band back in Kentucky. The Headhunters were, did a lot of blues. And uh, we played him a cassette and we got talking back and forth. He come to visit us in Kentucky, uh, heard us play. And he, it wasn't him alone. He gave us $4,500 and said, go make you a, go make you a tape or whatever. And um, of course we paid him back. Once picked on Nashville, <laughs> did what they're gonna do. But yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on the thanks to Jonathan D. W. Lyle, that forty five hundred dollars gave us a career. Thank you, Jonathan D. W. Lyle. Thank you, sir. And for that, yeah. I mean, back then, like that was a lot of money, wasn't it? Sure was, buddy. We went to Sound Shop in eighty eight. We recorded. Let me show you. Let me, if I can find it. I'll show you exactly what we did. Okay. 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 This is the very first version. This is what the $4,500 bought. You see this right here? Yeah. That's the original version of Picking on Nashville. It was on a cassette. Oh, and there was eight awesome. songs. There are eight songs. And we did a showcase at the end of 88 at Douglas Corner. And there was another label run by Larry Hamby uh, he ran Sony and he was he was interested in signing the band but when he heard us live he said you guys are way too rock for this label there was another gentleman there by the name of Harold Shedd that was uh, running Mercury Records at the time and he loved what we were doing and he took one of these cassettes back to the office and listened to it and he signed us to Mercury Records and we went back and recorded two more songs in 89. We remixed all this and then Pick It On Nashville was released in October of 1989. And if you look back there on the, uh, which I, you see at Grammy back there? Yeah, yeah, I do. That, that's for Pick It On Nashville right there. Wow. Yeah. So, isn't it funny how fate has, uh, you have to go down different roads and open different doors. Some doors close, some doors are open, and things just happen. Yeah. They do. It's kind of just yeah. like a like a fifty. But thanks to Jonathan D.W. Lyle for the forty five hundred dollars to make that happen. Is that like four hundred and fifty thousand dollars now? <laughs> I don't think it's that much, but it's it's 
quite a bit. I'm not sure how, I don't know how that would work out. Somebody got a calculator out there they can figure that out? Nah, nah. It's probably, uh, what is it now? 20,000, 15,000, 20, something like that. You know? Yeah, we saved a lot of money. <laughs> hey, $4,500 to us back in 1988. When we recorded that, we was, that was uh, that was quite a bit of money. Ugh. It was. Were you guys like, we won the lottery, let's go! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, we were lucky. We've been blessed, guys, man, to do what we've done. Yeah, and that, like, demo became picking on Nashville. God, you guys just famous. Yeah. Guys. Well, the, well, actually, we sold these. We sold these. Uh, we played in Bowling Green, Kentucky. We played in Louisville. We played in Nashville. We sold these. Uh, there was a little record store here in Glasgow. There was one in Bowling Green. Uh, there was a store in Louisville, Air Ecstasy Records. They sold this. And matter of fact, when we signed our record deal, I had to go back to the record store in Louisville and grab what was left and take it off the market. But yeah, it was a demo, but we were selling this to people that came to the shows. Uh you know? uh, how many is there left? I've got two. I've got two. Now, a lot of people don't realize this. We even done a 45 record before this. Uh, Walk Softly and Hold On To Me, but it, it was a different session. It, it has a whole different sound. We weren't, it, it was pretty cool too. A, a lady funded that. Yeah. Well, uh, which one do you like the, the best? The, the, the first one or the second one? You giving it? Oh, oh, this 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 was absolutely the definitive version, oh. you know, of the first 45. We were still trying to we were still maturing as a band. We really hadn't found our sound. But by this album right here, things have come together. Of course, we've grown since then. We don't sound like the picking on Nashville band. It's changed a bit, you know. And uh music is ever changing ever-changing do you uh sell any more now these right here yeah oh these are gone oh these yeah. are gone these, these have been gone a long time brother i i've got two here at the house and i matter of fact yesterday i thought hey, you know what i'm gonna bring this in here in case somebody asks about this and uh, i can show it to people yeah you know? uh, man so um is this a really unique interview for you like interviewing with a kid and stuff absolutely yeah. absolutely you know what you're talking about brother thanks and you like you like the blues don't you yeah i do I'm a... <laughs> <laughs> you're just a man you're really good at the country stuff what do you prefer more <laughs> i'm just a country bumpkin playing the blues man yeah i got so... to play with buddy guy i got to play with buddy guy the other night in louisville and that was fun uh and i'll, I'll say this um uh, I do a blues radio show every Monday night out of Bowling Green, Kentucky on the classic rock station WDNS. And it's from 7 to 10 Central Standard Time. It's called the Lowdown Hoedown. And you can hear it on the internet. You can uh, go to WDNSFM.com or you can go to 93 or see WDNSFM.com our d93rocks.com and uh, you can check us out and d93 has a great app and every monday night i play blues it's, i've been known to play a little zeppelin every now and then too you never know man you just like you play everything don't you I, i'm a dj i'm a guitar player and uh i like to talk oh uh, who is your favorite guest my favorite guest um Man, I've had some good ones. I had Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. I've had Peter Frampton. Um, I had Glenn Hughes from Deep Purple. Uh, I've had Marty Stewart. Uh, I've had Vince Gill. Um, oh, my Lord. John Sebastian from The Love and Spoonful. Uh, gosh, who's my favorite? I don't know. That'd be a hard, hard to answer, man. Can you count me as a guest? Please. Yeah, you could be a guest. I could have Jam Man on sometime, couldn't I? That would be awesome, man. 
I want to be. Maybe we can make it happen this winter when things slow down for me. Okay. All right. I'm down. You remind John Lappin, okay? All right. All right. I'm down then. You ready? You ready for this? <laughs> I'm ready, brother. We'll do it. All right. all right. Do you have any like worst? To, do you have any worst guests, or were all of them like really nice? Everybody, everybody's been nice. The only one that was quiet was Johnny Winter. Okay. And, but Johnny, it wasn't because he was rude. You know, Johnny had some health issues at the end. And, um, <laughs> you know, God bless him. I'd, I, I would uh, ask him a pretty good question. And, um, you know, and I would lay it out there and he would just, he would come back and go, oh, that's right. All right. And the interview was pretty much done in like 15 minutes, you know, uh, but that wasn't because he was mean or rude. It was just because uh, he didn't feel real good. But I've never had anybody mean. How about you? Has it all been pretty good? Um, No, if I actually like some people like say, go show away, kid. Get out of here. He said what? Like some people like some people are just mean to me because I'm a kid. Oh, no, man. No, man. You, How old are you? Ten. I, some people were. I think it's great. I think it's great that you're doing this, and uh, you know, and you'll grow. You know, you'll grow at this. We all grow at whatever we do. And if you, you do, you love what you're doing. Yes, I actually do. I really enjoy talking with you. Well, don't ever let the negative experiences, um, uh, you know, make you want to stop. Just keep doing it, man. Keep doing it. I've, I've enjoyed talking to you, man. I, and I, I was told that I would have fun talking to you. Yeah. So just don't stop, okay? Okay. I promise you. You got to keep doing it. Keep doing it. And, uh, man, just love your music. And, and music will be good to you right back, okay? Yeah. As always, people, the music has been nice to me. And I'm back. Me too, brother. Me yeah. too. And you're a young man, and you you got lot you got the world by the tail, and you got a lot of time ahead of you. Where do you live at? Uh, Buffalo, New York. Buffalo. Buffalo. I love Buffalo. I played Buffalo before. Don't you guys have a pretty good blues festival up there? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I played that. It's been a long time, but uh, we played some club up there many years ago too. I remember we almost got snowed in, <laughs> but uh, Buffalo's a great town. Yeah. It's been a pleasure talking to you, my friend. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Wait, I got to do one more thing, though. Is it okay? Yes, sir. My dad actually had him on my show, Johnny Winters. I ha had him on his show, and that was the last interview that he did with, was with oh, my yeah. dad. Well, you under, you under, well, your dad understands what I'm talking about then. Was Johnny kind of quiet with him, too? Yeah, he was, big time. He was nice. He probably Paul, Paul Nelson probably set it up, right? Yeah. Boneless and duck. Gotcha. How? Man, yeah, but yeah. Is he still alive? Is Johnny? Oh, no, Johnny passed ooh, three or four years ago, maybe five years ago. He was sick, you know. Um, I had, I talked to him. I saw him play right before he died. Oh. And uh, yeah. He was a good, he was a good fella. I like Johnny. He just, just at the end, he was just a, he, you know, he wouldn't engage in a conversation, but he didn't feel good, you know, but no. my Lord, he could play. He yeah. could play. He, he, could he was a great player. Yeah. And don't you let, let people discourage you. I can't believe somebody would mistreat you and be mean to you. People just, you know, us, us can, me and Fred might come up here and kick their butts if they're not nice to you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, man. It just that you know people just think probably is because like oh my god it's a kid so they think they're just getting like downed like they're going way yeah. down no you keep doing what you love and you're sound like your dad loves music too so that's good that y'all doing this together yeah, yeah. he's a he's a, the reason why i actually got this started because he was an interviewer as well and i just thought hey i don't want to try it and that's here wonderful I am. That's great. God bless you, buddy. God bless you too. Well, I've got to go eat some soup and I've got to go to a studio and put some guitar down on a friend's track. So I can we we'll we'll do this again sometime, okay? Okay. All right. Well, thank you for being on my show. You tell John Lappin I really enjoyed talking to you. Okay. And I hope I answered everything you wanted. That, that I hope I'm not was no. there anything else you need to know? 
Uh, can I get one more question though? It's kind of sorry. Yes, you may. Yes, no, you I'm may. So, I don't know. I don't want to disrupt your suit, man. I'm sorry. Oh no, go ahead. What What do you want to ask? Now, when Ricky left the band, he said he w- it was because of you guys were to rock and roll, and he wanted to be more country. You talking about Ricky Lee? Yeah. Um, it, you know, you're going back to 1992. It was really crazy times. You know we were thrown into this whole thing. It was nuts, man. I mean, the first album was released in October of 89 and pretty quick. It took off fast. It was like jumping on a, it was like jumping on a wild horse and you couldn't get off. Um, Yes. I think Ricky was more wanting to do a little different sound and we were a little bit more rock and roll, but I don't know if Ricky really wanted, I, I, I can't speak for Ricky. I love Ricky Phelps. And uh, I think Ricky had, had, had Ricky's actually in the ministry now. Okay. And, and so he's preaching a bit. I think Ricky had other things to do. He just didn't know what he had to do at the point. Yeah. They went off to do the Brother Phelps thing, you know, and that kind of, they went from Brother Phelps 92 to 95. And then Doug Phelps, uh, Brother Phelps went away in 95 and Doug came back to our band. So uh, he was just, it's just one of those things that happen. Uh, there's no animosity, no bad feelings towards Ricky. I love him. And he, he knows I love him. And it's just one went down, brother. You know? Okay, yeah. Well, thank you for being on my show. The next time we talk is at the backstage at one of your shows, dude. You enjoy your show. You got it. You yeah. got it, Jeff. What, what's your name now? Uh, Ramsey. Je- Ramsey? Yeah, R-E-M-Z-I. Okay, Ramsey. Okay. <laughs> I've been calling you, yeah, we'll call you Jam, man, or whatever you want. Okay. You take care, buddy. I'm going to have some soup then. I'm going to go play some music, okay? All right. Yeah, you enjoy yourself, man. I'll see you. All right. Bye, y'all. See bye. you. Bye. Bye. Peace.